A lot of people, Flat Earthers and other critics alike, have asked why I focus specifically on the Flat Earth Conspiracy. They ask why I don't go after anti-vaxxers, or 9-11 truthers, or UFO hoaxers. Aside from the fact that I plan to be delving into these topics, there's a very simple reason why I fight Flat Earth. Because I love space. Once, when I was about 8 years old, me and my dad were watching The Empire Strikes Back. My dad doesn't exactly have what you'd call an abundance of traditional education, but he's street smart and he shares my love for space. We talked about how there's not supposed to be sound in space, and why. We talked about how the asteroid field that the Millennium Falcon weaves through is impossible. Real life asteroid fields have hundreds of thousands of kilometers between each asteroid. We also made a pact. We swore that if either of us, or both of us, were to come across a spaceship from science fiction, we would board it and leave without looking back once. The point of this story is to explain how far back my love for, and therefore my knowledge of, space and the task of exploring it goes. I've been self-studying space for a long time, and every day I learn something new and amazing about it. The possibilities are endless, but for flat earthers, the possibilities are few, far between, and extremely finite. Flat Earth is so horribly underdeveloped. Not only is it incapable of explaining basic earthbound phenomena, like the disappearance of ships in the sun, gravity, or tides, but it's also incapable of explaining everything we see in the sky. It's just lights, they say. Just lights in the firmament. Well, Flurfs, I say you've got some splainin' to do. I want you to give me a Flat Earth equivalent to Stellar Evolution. All I'm going to do to make my point here is explain a little bit of what's known about the stars in the sky, and all I want Flurfs to do is give me a counter-argument. Each and every aspect of what I'm about to say, I want to hear what you think is really happening. A star's life begins, appropriately enough, in a place called a stellar nursery. We know of a number of these. Most nebulae are star-forming regions. Bear in mind that while space agency telescopes can render these in much higher detail, these are things you can see for yourself with a home telescope. These are enormous clouds of dust, helium, hydrogen, and other ionized gases. There was a time, before we understood what the Milky Way itself was, that other galaxies like Andromeda were also nebulae, but this has since changed. Over time, these gases will drift and intermingle with each other and the force of gravity will slowly condense them into compact masses that start pulling in more and more material, forming a protostellar cloud. This cloud continues to undergo gravitational collapse, the dust within the material becoming heated to temperatures of 600 to 100 Kelvin. A core region, called the first hydrostatic core, forms where the collapse is inevitably halted and begins to heat up even more. Once it reaches about 2000 Kelvin, a complex series of chemical and gravitational processes cause an eventual state of hydrostatic equilibrium, forming a protostar. Many of these protostars have what is called a circumstellar disk, which is essentially a ring of material collected by the young star's gravity, and is slowly diffusing into the star. Once this accretion process is finished, what is left is called a pre-main sequence star, depending on its mass. If it's too massive, it will actually collapse again, never quite reaching the main sequence. In its pre-main sequence, a star is optically visible, and has acquired nearly all of its mass, but not yet started hydrogen fusion. They can be observed either as a T Tauri star, if it has a low mass, or a Herbig AE slash BE star, if the mass is higher. They will contract further, until they begin to burn hydrogen, becoming a main sequence star, like our own sun. They again enter a state of hydrostatic equilibrium balance between the gravitational collapse of its mass and the outward thermal pressure of its hot core. After the main sequence, the star will do one of two things. I've already covered this in another video in more detail, see The Fate of Soul for more information, but I'll run through the basics again. A lower mass star will expand into a red giant, needing to burn hydrogen in a massive outer shell around an inert core that has no hydrogen left to fuse. Eventually, they collapse into a white dwarf and expel matter into a planetary nebula. Larger mass stars will similarly expand into supergiants, and then destroy themselves in massive supernova explosions, leaving behind either a very small, very fast neutron star, or a black hole. 
Now, bear in mind, these processes take billions of years. Different stages of all of it has been observed and detailed theories have been created to make sense of it. The math checks out, the various scales and evolution graphs check out, and predictions have been made and confirmed. That, my friends, is how science works, and it's an ongoing experiment that started at the beginning of civilization. It's changed numerous times because science is, contrary to popular belief, not infallible. Like I mentioned, galaxies were once thought to be nebulae. Black holes had been theorized long before they were actually observed, just like Pluto was predicted before it was observed. It was quite literally discovered because of observations of gravity, the gravity of the other objects in the solar system. Another thing we know of and can observe, sort of, is the Great Attractor. That is an unknown source of immense gravitational force that is slowly pulling all of the galaxies within the Launiakea supercluster around it. This has been observed due to redshift of nearby galaxies. This is an indication of a wavelength increase that tells us they are receding relative to us and each other. Speaking of great space things, how about the Great Red Spot? That's something else we can observe. A persistent anticyclonic storm large enough to contain two to three Earths, 22 degrees south of Jupiter's equator. So, these are my questions, Flat Earthers. It's often said that science can answer questions of how, but not why. And a logical conclusion is that a religion, or a cult, can answer the why. However, today I'm challenging you to answer the why that science has just answered. Why do the lights in the sky behave the way they do? We've got our theories, and they're solid. What's your excuse? If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe to my channel, which is Dead Kennedy in Space. If you want to support me further, consider donating on Patreon or purchasing some of my work through Amazon or Teespring. Thank you, and I'll see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. Live there. On the mode of dust. Suspended. In a sunbeam. In a fast cosmic arena.